Welcome to In Focus with Ajaz Heather. Tonight, before I get to our top story, let me inform the viewers of another regressive step taken by the Indian government. As detailed on this program, we are witnessing a steady pattern emerging in India. The right-wing RSS government in that country is not only pursuing a destabilizing foreign policy in relation to regional states, but also clamping down on freedom of expression and dissent within. In a recent move, India's Enforcement Directorate has seized Amnesty International India's properties worth 176 million Indian rupees. The decision, according to the Indian government, has been taken because of alleged violation of Foreign Contribution Regulation Act. Amnesty has rejected this allegation. It's important to remember that Amnesty International India halted its operations in that country last September, accusing the government of pursuing a witch hunt against human rights organizations. At the time, Amnesty had said its bank accounts had been frozen and it had been forced to lay off staff in the country and suspend all its campaign and research work. Rajat Khosla, Amnesty's senior director of research, advocacy and policy, had at the time told the BBC and I'm quoting his exact words. We are facing a rather unprecedented situation in India. Amnesty International India has been facing an onslaught of attacks, bullying and harassment by the government in a very systematic manner. This is all down to the human rights work that we were doing and the government not wanting to answer questions we raised whether it's in terms of our investigations into the Delhi riots or the silencing of voices in Jammu and Kashmir, unquote. Before that, in 2019, India's Central Bureau of Investigation had raided the Bengaluru and New Delhi offices of Amnesty International India. At the time, Amnesty had said, and once again, I quote from their statement, Amnesty India stands in full compliance with Indian and international law. Our work in India as elsewhere is to uphold and fight for universal human rights. These are the same values that are enshrined in the Indian constitution and flow from a long and rich Indian tradition of pluralism, tolerance and dissent." Unquote. Now come these raids. While India continues to claim to be the world's most populous democracy, its record under Mr. Narendra Modi's government is going from bad to worse and the world has begun to take note of this. Let's now get to our top story tonight. Lookout, a US-based cybersecurity company, says two malware programs on an Android-based platform that emerged in India have been spying on the Pakistani military and other important figures in the Pakistani government. In a 10th February statement, Lookout said it has discovered the two malware programs, Hornbill and Sunbird, which are used by a cyber group named Confucius. Confucius first appeared in 2013 as a state-sponsored pro-India actor primarily pursuing Pakistani and other South Asian targets. This is straight from the lookout statement. Targets of these tools include personnel linked to Pakistan's military, nuclear authorities, and Indian election officials in Kashmir. Hornbill and Sunbird have sophisticated capabilities to exfiltrate SMS, encrypted messaging, app content, and geolocation, among other types of sensitive information. The Lookout report, which we are about to discuss, is a clear indictment of India's aggressive activities against Pakistan. The EU Desinfo Lab has already put out two reports on how a shadowy group has been putting out disinformation to malign Pakistan. There's a clear pattern here, but let's get to our experts to try and understand the nature of this attack. I'm joined by Pier Louis Paganini, member of the European Union Agency for Network and Information Security, Threat Landscape Stakeholder Group and Cyber G7 Group, and Ammar Jafri, who's a former additional director general of Federal Investigation Agency and currently heads ePakistan Vision 2025. Let's get to this issue of malware. Uh, Pierre Luigi, uh, give me your opening statement on this in terms of the nature of this attack and uh, how significant it is. 
and how worried should we be in Pakistan? Okay, let's say that uh, Sasha at uh, Lookout have analyzed the two recently discovered Android spyware families, dubbed the Hanbil and Sabid. They are suspected to be part of the arsenal of an advanced persistent group that uh, has been tracked as Confucius. Confucius is a pro India APT group that has been activity since. Uh, 2030, it's, it's, it's old, uh, it's mainly focused on Pakistan and other South Asian targets. It's, uh, it's a pro-India group, and uh, this means that um, its operation act in the interest of the India. This means that the, the interest of the APT group are aligned with the, uh, the one of the Indian government. It was mainly involved in cyber espionage activities, so not sabotage at this time. And the spyware were used to spy on the personnel linked to Pakistan military, uh, nuclear authorities, and also Indian election officials in Kashmir. Clearly, uh, in my opinion, the attackers are politically motivated. Right. And this is Android-based, so does that mean that uh, the, the Mac and Apple uh, you know, software uh, cannot be affected by this? No, uh, in this specific case, uh, Lookout has analyzed the two specific malware that, are, have, that have been uh, developed to, to target Android device. Uh, anyway, the group has used in the past also malware that, that were designed to target also Mac and other desktop applications. Oh, so they, they, they can uh, attack the Mac software also? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, 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 yeah. It's correct, but it's not related to the specific campaign. Lookout has uh, has raised the alert only on a campaign that is involving uh, Android malware. But we have evidence that since 2011, the group has also used the specific malware that were able to target um, Windows device, for example, and other desktop platform. Right. Stay with me, uh, Luigi. Let me pull in Mr. Jaffrey here. Uh, Mr. Jaffrey, you've been uh, traditional director general of FIA also, um, and clearly, uh, you know, you know how these things work. So give us a sense of, is this the first time uh, a pro-India group has tried to do this, or has there been a precedent of this kind of attack or, or spying sort of, you know, uh, attempt? Thank you very much for inviting me to this very important uh, discussion. Firstly, I would like to explain that this is you know, cyber warfare, hybrid warfare. I think gone are the days of the actual uh, foot on the ground. So this is uh, nothing new, uh, nothing new, I think, in, in, the, in the world of war. There has been a slang that is bites before bullets. What is this? You send some bites and then you come with the bullets. So this is a attack, I think, on a very, very sensitive issue. And because uh, traditionally WhatsApp is, is, is assumed to be a encrypted communication, whatsoever they claim. So this company, look out, uh, this is a cyber threat intelligence company and they have, they have un, 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 uh, uncovered this uh, 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 issue that uh, two uh, apps, malwares, which is uh, Horn uh, uh, Shell and uh, this Sunbird, I think uh, these are uh, working and on, on Android phone, and uh, they are targeting the personnel who are dealing with sensitive information, and they are not targeting only in the home country, they are targeting when they are traveling abroad also. So when they travel abroad, it means that they have their extended infrastructure, uh, taking advantage of their uh, GSM or Wi-Fi system. So I think uh, this is something very serious, and uh, we should take it seriously. and. Uh, Maybe at some level, we can take it to the level of Interpol and uh, the Singapore office of Interpol, I think uh, the, the government of Pakistan should complain it. But definitely we'll have to go with the digital footprints and all the required evidence. This, this will be my uh, take on this subject. Okay, uh, so uh, tell us what role, if any, when something like this happens, what role, if any, does the FIA play? Uh, does the government get to the FIA? Uh, does the FIA have the capability to, uh, to actually track this back? Uh, what exactly does the FIA do? In every country, Interpol has a point of contact. In case of Pakistan, FIA is the point of contact for Interpol. 
So uh, the FIA, uh, the government should tell to the FIA and uh, the point of contact of Interpol with the required evidence should give it to the Interpol that this is the something happening and uh, definitely we'll, we'll, we will have to have the cooperation of WhatsApp also. So but because it's a platform based attack. So I think uh, with the international norms and standards uh, based on the agreements they already signed with the organizations, I think they will provide, provide us this information and we should take it up a very, at, at, at the highest level possible. Because I think uh, th this is not the first case in the world. There have been a number of instances. There has been an attack on Estonia in 2007, also similar attacks. So uh, there have been a lot of history of such a malware attacks on different uh, sensitive issues. Because, you know, now this is the era of cyber warfare. So I am worried that there be, uh, we, are, we are having elections in Pakistan in the future also. So, Somebody can uh, disturb the election campaigns also. So I think uh, we should take it very seriously and try to investigate it through Interpol and whosoever is fine is, is involved in it. We should raise it at the international level. Right. So I say Interpol. So I'm assuming that Interpol has its own uh, cyber uh, wing uh, of sorts, experts who. Uh, with whom you can, you know, uh, uh, who you can inform and who can then, if you have traced this back, then Interpol gets into action and, uh, and arrest those people. How does this work? Uh, the regional office of Interpol is in Singapore, which deal with the, this part of the world. So I have been there in Singapore. They have got excellent capabilities of, uh, of identifying these things. Uh, the only point is that how government of Pakistan approaches them with which evidence and I think uh, this uh, lockout uh, company, which is a uh, threat intelligence team, they, they, they have come out with a wonderful report also. It's, it's a public now, it's not a secret now. So we should talk to them also that what evidence they have found, what the footprint they have found, and we'll be more interested that what were their targets and how this malware is working. Because they are not targeting them inland, they're targeting them when they travel abroad also. Uh, let me go back to Pierre Luigi here. Pierre Luigi, uh, two questions. One, I want you to translate what I'm going to say, translate that into English for those who are not uh, techies. Uh, so, sophisticated capabilities to exfiltrate SMS, encrypted messaging app content, and geolocation, among other types of sensitive information. So, you have to translate that into layperson's language. And second question, uh, once this is traced uh, by the government of Pakistan, uh, as Ms. Jaffrey was saying, then you, you know, we can connect with Interpol. So how does then Interpol work on something like this? Let's start from the, the first question. Uh, both malware can expatriate a wide range of data, and uh, they can spy on call logs, contact, uh, metadata, geolocation. This means that they can follow the movements of the, the people that is uh, under the control. They can exfiltrate image data and also uh, both, uh, WhatsApp noises. So they are turning our mobile device in a perfect spying device. This means that they are doing all the, this, this, this application can spy on individuals and uh, they collect any kind of information on individuals and on in its network of interaction. So they are able to understand who is speaking with this guy, if they are transferring some specific messages and which is the movements, uh, which is the location of these people. And these are, these are information very useful in a, a cyber espionage campaign. So it's very dangerous. The the other aspect is okay. That, okay, okay. Um, let's let's let's, let's uh, Pierre Luigi. Before we go to the Interpol aspect, because what said is is very interesting and also uh, very worrisome. So, just to just to recap what you have said, that if I am holding a sensitive government position, and here's my device, and this device is gotten hold of by by this uh, hacker company. Now, they don't want to disrupt anything. In fact, what they want to do is that I should not know that they've taken hold of my device. Now, whatever I say, whatever messages I forward, whoever I talk to, whoever I message to, everything, uh, that data goes back to them. Uh, so uh, have I got that right? 
Yeah, you are right. And there is another thing. Uh, these devices, these, uh, these malware are able to record any environment sounds. This means that if you are speaking also of sensitive uh, information, if you are speaking about confidential, secret information in a room, this device could be enabled to uh, record any kind of conversation that is, uh, is happening and are able to transfer this, uh, this conversation to the command and control. So they are able to, trans to transform, to turn our mobile device in the perfect spying devices. Right, so uh, would they also be able to take hold of the devices of people that I am uh, messaging with or uh, that won't be possible? Of course, of course, they are able to to uh, to take uh, all the, the information that are uh, stored on the mobile device. They are able also to have the list of contact. They are able to have also the log calls. This means that in any time they are able to understand where you are, who are the people that are calling you, and who are calling you, uh, which are the information. They, they can also record the conversation, so they they are able to record the call audio, and this is very scary. And, and okay, so if I'm, I have apps on my mobile device, which I also have on my laptop, and so I, I use these two platforms, I'm assuming that then they would also have access to my laptop. Uh, they, in, some, in some cases, they can, because some of these applications could, could also infect the laptop too. In this specific case, uh, both applications are not designed to infect the, the devices or the laptop itself. But the same uh, threat actor, the same Pro India group, has also in his arsenal specific malware that are able to infect your PC. So your desktop. Right, so let's get to now the Interpol part of the question. Regarding the Interpol, uh, the Interpol is just one of the actors that could be involved in these cases. Uh, in Europe, for example, but all over the world, there, is, there are other centers that are more focuses, focused on this kind of activity, and they are core, called, uh, called CERT, that are uh, emergency center, and uh, each, um, each, uh, each uh, let me say, government has its official CERT, that is the Center for the Response to Cyber Attacks. This center uh, collects any kind of information regarding the attacks on any, uh, any entities that is related to his countries. And the importance of the CERT teams is that the CERT teams uh, actively exchange information of, about the attacks. What this means? If we are able in this moment to understand that there is an ongoing attack against the Pakistan and it is done using true malware, the information regarding the malware are exchanged among these CERT uh, teams. And the CERT teams alert the government and also all the government offices and the, uh, let me say, major companies and the critical infrastructure of any countries in order to protect to, to say, hey guy, someone is attempting to hack you, we have to adopt this best practice in order to protect you. Right, that's very, very interesting. Uh, let me go back to Ms. Jaffrey. Ms. Jaffrey, what uh, Ms. Paganini is saying uh, with reference to how this operates uh, clearly indicates the seriousness of this kind of activity. Uh, he also mentioned uh, as Lookout has also uh, indicated that this is a pro-India group and uh, clearly this kind of information is going back to the Indian uh, intelligence agencies. So uh, given the seriousness of this, uh, what are the, I, I'm sure there are going to be domestic laws uh, in Pakistan, but what is the, uh, what's the nature of, if at all, uh, you know, some multilateral or international legal regime uh, in and through which these things can be dealt with? Okay. Confucius actually, advanced persistent threat is a known Indian sponsored group. Let's define the advanced persistent threats. It keep on trying, keep on trying, keep on trying. And as the uh, international news says, 
that they were targeting the content, the geophysical, uh, geolocations, and the uh, communication, everything. So I think uh, the first step should be, we should collect the forensics, we should collect the digital forensics, because wherever you go, you go through via Interpol, you go to some other international court of law, all these locations, uh, they will be asking for the uh, digital forensics. And digital forensics must be collected by the reliable organizations and uh, reliable uh, platforms so that we can present it in the court of law. So we'll have to see it. We'll have to see the uh, local, uh, local laws definitely, definitely support us. We have a cyber crime laws in Pakistan. But definitely when you apply those laws at the national level, you have to enter through Interpol. And there's a perfect bridging between government of Pakistan and Interpol on these matters. And uh, I think it all depends by the end of the day that what evidence we take and uh, uh, which from which IP address, normally these are spoofed IP address, so we have to unspoof them, uh, localize the servers they were uh, using. And uh, this, this can be a, a man in the middle attack also, this can be a direct attack also. So we have to uh, physically and digitally identify the forensics evidence and then go to the court of law. Thank you so much. That was Amar Jafri speaking with us. Uh, we go back to uh, Pierre Luigi. Now, Pierre Luigi, there is another issue here. So, what happens when, in this case, it, this has been discovered that attacker X is uh, targeting uh, officials in state Y, but it is going through certain apps? Now, once that attack has been identified, does the, the aggrieved party also uh, indicate to the, the, the uh, uh, what do you call it, the, the apps, uh, the platform, and tell them that clearly there is some kind of vulnerability in the app which has been exploited by the attacker? Uh, is that how this works? In this specific case, the apps uh, were not, um, let me say, uh, we don't find uh, any kind of vulnerability in the app itself. These apps were developed from scratch to appear as legitimated apps, but they included the specific code to spy on the users. So it's something different. So it's not an attack that is uh, exploiting a vulnerability in a software. They are oh. developing a totally new software that once installed on a device, it can take the control of the device itself. So this is a, an important issue. What happens, what happens in, the, in these cases? Uh, from a technical point of view, it's quite easy because once this kind of campaign have been discovered, we have exactly what we call indicator of compromise. This means that we are able to uh, identify any kind of infected device. Uh, we are able to erase the threat from the device itself. But there is also another issue. If we are sure that there is a, a potential involvement of a, let me say, a state-sponsored, let me say it's important to understand that from technical point of view, we, we can fight this threat and we are able now to detect this kind of, a, of attacks. But there is another aspect that it is the geopolitical aspect that uh, this means that probably your government would try to speak with the Indian government in order to say, hey guy, you are spying on us. We have the evidence that you are collecting some information. And from that point, start a geopolitical discussion between the two governments. Right, and right. Unfortunately, that's not possible given the the yeah. tenor of yeah, tenor of I, relations yeah. relations we have right now with the Indians. But um, uh, give me uh, uh, the uh, you know. Uh, but, but, uh, but it's very it's very. It's very important that you have, find, you have found an evidence that probably link an attack from a, a also a, a state that is your enemy, because this is a part of the geopolitical discussion between the governments. And it's also important if you analyze the overall situation, when you speak also with the relation with other actors, you have to consider that the same group is also targeted other entities in South Asia. So it's not so only Pakistan, but also other entities in South Asia. Right. Uh, one final question, uh, Pierre Luigi. Uh, 
because uh, you know most of the users are not uh, tech savvy uh, what what precautions what basic precautions can the user take in order to avoid uh, becoming a victim of this kind of attack won't install a security, uh, let me say, solution on your mobile devices because it's very important. Another suggestion is never download and install any application from third party. So if you have an Android, only go on Google Play. This can reduce the possibility that you are a victim of any kind of attacks. We cannot exclude it can happen, but you can uh, dramatically reduce this likelihood. And another thing that I always suggest, only install those applications that you need. Every application that you install potentially is enlarging your surface of attacks. So be careful. Right, that's very important advice. Thank you so much, Pia Luigi Paganini, for speaking with us. We shall take a short break and return to discuss a positive change in Pakistan's visa policy. Stay with us. Welcome back to In Focus. While India cracks down on dissent at home and is closing up, a confident Pakistan is welcoming visitors from other countries. The government has introduced the medical visa category. You know, recently revised policy easing rules for people who want to come to Pakistan for health, emergencies, and work. According to a letter issued by the Ministry of Interior to the Director General of Immigration and Passports, the federal cabinet approved new changes to the visa policy on 2nd February. Under the new guidelines, security clearance would not be required for those seeking a short-term medical visa or an individual work visa. This is a welcome move. Let's get some more details on this policy. I'm joined by Ambassador Najmuddin Sheikh, a former foreign secretary of Pakistan. Ambassador Sheikh, thank you for being on the program. As I said, this is a very good move. Uh, what are your impressions about this? Well, I think that the principal users of the medical visa uh, will be our uh, friends from across uh, the Afghan border. And uh, frankly, I think that what will happen is that now, uh, rather than crowding uh, at the uh, consulate in, in Kandahar or, uh, or uh, uh, elsewhere, and uh, they will now have to apply uh, uh, online. Uh, this will mean that you will create a new uh, sort of class of people in Afghanistan who will help uh, these largely illiterate or less educated people, and certainly not all of them are computer literate, uh, to fill out the necessary details and apply for the visa. But well, from my uh, perspective, as I see it at this time, uh, the, the people who will be asking for medical uh, visas will primarily be from Afghanistan. There may be others who come, but uh, by and large, it will be uh, our uh, neighbors from Afghanistan who uh, are currently crossing across in fairly large numbers, uh, both at Chaman uh, uh, and uh, uh, Turkham. So now, uh, rather than crowding those um, uh, places, they will uh, ask for them. Uh, they will have to have some people fill out the necessary details and apply online. Uh, it may be uh, a streamlining from our perspective, and it will certainly avoid the sort of incidents that have happened where in Jalalabad, uh, a lot of uh, Afghans were injured because they were crowding the uh, consulate, and uh, there, there was a stampede in which many people were injured. So uh, from one perspective, it, is, it will ease that particular problem. But uh, in another, it will make it necessary for these Afghans uh, to uh, go to someone to help them fill out uh, the necessary details for an online visa. Right. I uh, perfectly understand the second point that you're making, but I also assume, given uh, how uh, Afghans can improvise things, that that would be possible. But and, and without prejudice to what you're saying, because Afghans do come to Pakistan, this has been going on for years and years now, even before this policy, but the policy itself uh, does not specify the Afghans, so I'm assuming that others uh, can also come to Pakistan on this. 
uh, just uh, to make a point, according to the document, a single entry work visa would be issued to an individual for up to three months within 48 hours of the application's submission. Security clearance would not be required, but intelligence agencies would be intimated. Uh, as I said, this is according to the document. An extended medical visa of up to one year, meanwhile, would be issued within a month after clearance from certain agencies. Uh, Ambassador Sheikh, another uh, question here. Uh, there, th there has been a view, and it's not just in Pakistan, it's this view as far as the intelligence agencies are concerned is generally uh, expressed uh, in, in, in many countries with reference to uh, the requirement for security clearance and to make sure that you know undesirable elements do not uh, enter the country. Uh, you've had a long and uh, you know very distinguished career as a diplomat. What is your take on the, this general sort of argument with reference to visa policies? No, I think I think that uh, to me the most attractive part part of this uh, uh, new visa policy is uh, the two things: one, uh, the tourism visa, and second, the religious visa. Uh, you know, we have we've talked a great deal about the attractions that we have for uh, people who want to uh, explore our, our breathtakingly lovely uh, views in, uh, in, uh, in the north, uh, in Gilgit, Baltistan, and in, uh, and in uh, uh, that entire area, Chitral, etc. And now I think that this, this is something that we have to promote vigorously. If, if the PTD and uh, if our uh, tourism uh, corporation is uh, uh, highlighting the facilities that it is creating, uh, we must be able to ensure that people who wish to come then don't have to wait for a long time to get their visas. So I think that uh, uh, the two things have to work in tandem, uh, the development of the tourist facility and the uh, granting of visas uh, very quickly and without uh, a great deal of, uh, of uh, hassle uh, that is usually involved. So to me, that is important. It is also important that you have what uh, you can call religious uh, tourism visas, because those we have uh, an enormous number of people uh, from uh, Japan and elsewhere, uh, Buddhists who wish to come and see the entire uh, Gandhara route and to see where all the stupas were. Uh, I know that uh, uh, high Japanese officials who have visited uh, Pakistan have sought uh, permission to spend three, four, and or, or a week or more at these stupas uh, where they, uh, uh, they, they fulfill uh, their religious uh, uh, obligations or uh, uh, enhanced uh, uh, facility for uh, uh, the worship that they wish to carry out. So these are going to be important. And I think that from our perspective, uh, opening up the country to this, uh, to tourism of every kind, but particularly these two very attractive uh, uh, considerations should be uh, of great benefit to us and to uh, the tourism industry in Pakistan. Right. Uh, this uh, policy also impacts positively uh, those who wish to come to Pakistan for work. So work, health emergencies, education, tourism, uh, and, and religious tourism also essentially uh, you know, uh, are areas that are being targeted by this policy. One final question, uh, Ambassador Sheikh. Uh, as I said, there's always been the issue of security. Now, uh, it seems that you know, someone has realized that uh, there are ways in which you can open up and yet not be insecure. Also, the fact that most people, uh, undesirable elements, that do come to Pakistan cross over in a way they don't require the visas. So give me your sense of how you look at this balance between security and opening up. Yes, I, I think I think that uh, we mustn't allow this particular obsession with uh, security uh, to uh, override what uh, benefits us. The work visa that you mentioned, I think we, we must be clear uh, that uh, when uh, uh, there are companies here which require expert assistance, they should be able to get that expert assistance as quickly as possible. I remember 
that as a consular officer, I sat in, uh, in Tehran uh, uh, and uh, uh, over, over six hours, I issued visas so that the Karachi Electric Supply Corporation could get the experts that needed at that particular time uh, to, to fix some problems that had arisen with their transmission facilities. Now, these are, these are the sort of things in which time is of the essence. And uh, uh, therefore, uh, if you can apply online and if the right uh, uh, preparation has been made, uh, in, including this uh, requirement that the company that is sponsoring the visit of the expert has uh, provided all the documentation necessary. I think we should uh, be happy uh, that uh, we have introduced this so that they can get a visa within hours. Now, uh, when it was when it was uh, uh, more physical, when uh, people had to apply, I sat there, I interviewed these gentlemen and satisfied myself that they were uh, uh, correct and then telephoned the Foreign Secretary's office and the, the Office of the Immigration and Passport people uh, to, to ensure uh, that uh, KESU was pushing from the other end uh, would be able to get the experts there on time. So now if you do this online, it will be much better and much easier uh, for people to get this assistance. Right. Second, that, you know, right now, you have a lot of people, uh, sorry, let me just continue this thing about the work visas. Uh, you get a lot of uh, things happening with uh, buyers uh, saying that, look, getting to Pakistan is too cumbersome. Uh, come to Dubai and we will meet there and, and finalize whatever deals have to be made. If you make the visa easier, they'll come here, they'll be able to see the facilities uh, uh, themselves and be able to proceed. I mean, of course, currently you have problems with the with the uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic, uh, but uh, we are talking about going beyond that particular pandemic. And for that, I think uh, this streamlining of the visa procedure is going to be very important. We, uh, on a more general note, we have to open up. We have to be a, a country that is more welcoming, more easily accessible, uh, and uh, to get over uh, some of the, the, the phobias that are entertained about Pakistan, uh, this opening up will help us to cure that also. And in this context, I think it is also important that we uh, let journalists come even when they are coming on short-term visits. If they are from reputable newspapers, I think we should be uh, happy to, to have them come. Uh, do a do a story, do two stories, and uh, and go away. I don't think we should insist that. Uh, no, no, it's only permanently accredited people who should be writing those stories. That's a very important point. Thank you for making that. Uh, excellent summation, uh, Ambassador Sheikh. Uh, no matter which way one slices or dices this, this is a very positive development, and I completely agree with uh, you know the views expressed by. Uh, uh, Ambassador Sheikh, thank you so much, sir, for being with us. This is all from In Focus this week. We shall see you next Monday at the same time. Keep following our latest updates on social media at indus.news. Good night and goodbye.